So people are ringing us up but using our products before, during or after jobs and they've got common questions. So what I'm planning today is to talk about what these questions are and what the answers are because this is the training part of what our products are. So just to state here, uh, technical and product support are a lot of our calls about this, that, this doesn't work, what about this and so forth. And also what's next, what's new, what, what's happening, where are we moving in the market. So they're the things we're going we're to touch on. Within that, uh, when my presentation comes up. These are the topics we're going to particularly touch on. Uh, digital modulators, which is a large part of our business. Uh, we're going to talk about how can we use multiple in one application, which is a common question we get these days. Uh, we're also going to touch on uh, another issue we have where when we mix in signals we get other problems and something to look for how to address that. We're going to touch a bit on IPTV systems, about distributing over IP, AV sources, and the uh, the advantages, the disadvantages, and just the the, uh, the the configuration process that needs to be considered when you're doing that type of application. And then we're going to touch a bit on the IR. And what we're going to touch on is its ability to be able to have a discrete IR function within it, which is unique to this product, which again is a common phone call and a question that we get about how to use that. So that, that's a general overview of what we're going to talk about. We'll go through it nice and smoothly. If you've got any questions, please ask as we go because at the end we either one, don't have time, two, forget about it. I'm happy to address them as they go. I find them easy to do it that way. Okay, so the, the most common call we get is these days people are wanting to, uh, either in commercial applications and now even in domestic, use more than one modulator at a time in a job. They might have multiple Foxtel channels they want to distribute. You might have a um, uh, a pub or a club that has 60, 80, 100 TVs and they want to have eight channels distributed to them. Coax is an easy method. A lot of existing jobs already have coax in. They don't all have UTP and moving forward they're still specking coax in on all jobs. And what a modulator can do is it can um, modulate, convert our AV source to an RF channel, ideally mix it into the existing free-to-air system and distribute everything down on one channel that a TV can be scanned in and can pick which it wants to watch. So what you have as an end result is a user-friendly, um, convenient system that is very easy to, to work, where you're just going channel up and down to find what you want. That's the end solution that you're looking for. But how do we do that? How do we get that to work? So what we're going to talk about is how to do that, and then, as I said, the balancing of the system. So we can actually install as many modulators in a job as we want. Right, limited to what bandwidth we have available, what channel we have available, but you, you, we can put two, three, four, five, six, eight single channel multi-input multi modulators in an application. For this to work, there are a few things that we need to work with though. We need to adjust a few of the settings. Uh, modulators that we sell, the, the Digimod modulators, are defaulted to Australian settings and are defaulted to be theoretically a plug and play product. You plug it in, connect your source, inject that RF into a system via a splitter and reverse, scan in TVs, and 99% of the time, there is your picture. This is done by the product being set to factory default settings that allow for this to happen. When we have multiple modulators though, they've got the same settings in each modulator. And what happens is that they can cause conflict if they're not changed. So, in a sense, there's five settings that we need to go and change if we're using more than one modulator in a job. Uh, my order's not correct, so I'm going to go in how I want to talk about it. Uh, the first one, most important one is, or not most important, but is the output channel. So you, we, we have our free-to-air broadcasters transmitting on channel 6, channel 8, channel 11, channel 12, and the other one. Um, these channels are being used. We can't use these channels to modulate our our to, to put our modulators onto. We have to put them onto something else. So as a default, uh, modulators used to be on channel 21. Um, they're now being moved to channel 39. So every modulator that comes out, when you plug it in, it's set to 39 on UHF. As I said, it used to be 21. The problem with 21 is that 21 is not actually a physical channel that a TV can scan. And we smartly did that to make people move it to what's available but then we've learned over time 
that people don't necessarily work that out and a lot of the tech support calls we were getting was I can't receive it, what output channel is it on, I left it as 21. That doesn't work. So rather than make them change it or you change it, we've actually now default changed them to channel 39. So as a default, every modulator will come out with a channel 39 as an output. So if we have multiple in a job, and if they're both on 39, TV can't scan both in on the same channel. So we have a problem. So what we need to do first of all is put them onto separate output channels that don't conflict with anything else. The other thing we need to do is when a TV receives the channel, uh, for example, we'll, we'll use channel seven um, from the towers. It, it is transmitting actually on channel six, even though it's called seven, because it used to be seven in analog. And then your TV receives it and goes, okay, I've got five services in channel six, which is seven, seven one, seven two, seven mate. And I'm gonna put them on what's called an LCN, which is a logic channel number. This is the number you press on your remote to access that channel. So if you want to watch channel 7, you press 7. You want to watch 70 or 7 mate, you press 7 4. This modulator also has the same, it has an LCM built into it, and as a default, it's on channel 101. So all modulators, the first channel is 101. If we have multiple modulators, they're all going to be on 101. So what we need to do is we need to put them onto different LCNs. So for example, if you had two single channels, you put one on 101 or in one on 102, just so it's a different channel. Anything that's free, you can put them into. So for example, if you have, uh, if we look at Melbourne, we have channel one HD, which is on one, ABC is on two, SBS is on three, and then channel seven is on seven. We theoretically have four, five, and six free for LCN. You move the modulators to four, five, and six, as long as they don't conflict with something else. Now, if you don't change it, and it does conflict with something, the TV will actually grab that channel and move it to channel 350 and 351 and 352. That's its free range. So if you, do, if you don't change it, it will still work, but that's what happens. It moves it somewhere where you may not know where it is. So it is best to change that. The other thing is the channel name. Okay, As a default, the modulator will come out called channel one. So the first input is always called channel one. If it's a multi-input modulator, like these two, it'll be the channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four. If you used two of these, you'll have two channel ones, two channel twos, two channel threes and fours and so on. Via the adjustment settings in the modulator, via either web management or via the PC itself, or the unit itself, we can change the channel name, not just to be one to eight, but we can call it ESPN. Blu-ray, Apple TV. So when you go to that channel on your TV, it'll tell you that this is Apple TV. So we recommend that you go and change that. If you don't change it, it still works. It's just difficult to know what's what. Fourth one is what we call a program number. Now this setting again is something that doesn't affect many installations. It's only really been a handful. There's certain TVs, if they're on the same program number, they don't like it and they don't seem to receive both. While you're doing other settings when you're stacking them, we just encourage you to go in and change it anyway, just to make sure. Because you might have it set up now that it's fine. They come along, put in new TVs. One of them has a problem because of the channel number, the program number. Just do it now at the same time. And what we actually recommend is you tie the program number into the LCN number. So if input one is LCN number 101, make the program number 101. 102, 102, and so forth. So it is different. The most important change is the last one, which is number two on my table, unfortunately, is the TSID. The TSID is the transport stream ID. Each service needs to have a different number, and all modulators, again, are defaulted on that one number. A lot of the other changes we can get away without doing, and it'll just be as a default, but not the TSID. If they're on the same TSID, it will not work. So you need to change the TSID. So for example, here's a, a default setting of using two modulators at, in a one installation. We're going to be using a single channel modulator and we're using a four channel modulator. So as we can see, you've got output channels are the same as a default. Actually, that should be 40, that's my error, um, because it does adjacent, I'll talk about that soon. Uh, LCN number, we have two 101s because that's the default. Program numbers, we have the same thing. Transport streams and channel names. So these settings we need to change to be able to use them in the one installation. 
And if we have more, if you had another four channel modulator or four four channel modulators, you'll have four of the same settings. So we need to go in and change them. Uh, so here is an example of what you would change them to for the system to work. So we've gone channel 39 on the first one and then adjust the second one to channel 40 and 41. So we're not conflicting. Channel up LCN numbers on our remote controls. We've gone 101 for the first one and then 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So they don't conflict. Program number, we've matched the LCN as we said so we don't conflict. Most importantly, stream IDs. Uh, the stream ID is, um, each modulator varies a little bit into what, how many inputs it has to how many stream IDs it has. So in a multi-channel modulator, even though it has four inputs, it actually adjusts them only on two. So again, we'll touch that a bit later. But now we have different stream IDs and we've gone in and changed our names from an MVR, it's a commercial job, we've got Fox Sports 1, Fox Sports 2, ESPN and Apple. So these changes will allow those five channels to go to every TV and work. Scan them in, plug and play, off you go. So here's your old, and then there's your new changes to do so. Does that make sense? That's pretty self-stored. It, 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 it's, it's very, very common for us to get calls that this is the issue, that the settings, they might change one or two. Um, we, once you're into it via the GUI, it takes you five seconds to make a change. It, it, you might as well do it while you're in there. The front displays are a little bit more complex and the entry level modulators actually don't give you this option via the front display. It is purely the GUI that allows you to do it. But the GUI is basic, which we'll touch on. So that, that, that's the changes you require for a system to work effectively. Using the GUI to do these changes, uh, here's some screenshots of uh, where we go. So originally, when you get into it, you'll have a welcome page. Uh, to connect into it, it is simply a, a UTP cable, a, a network cable from the modulator straight into a PC, or you can go into a router to a PC, and it can access it through your networks. Here's your welcome page, which gives you just basic information on the product. Um, on the side here, we have our tabs that we scroll through to make these changes. So we have a, um, the first one we go to is common setup, and common setup is where we change our output channel. So we're changing it from channel 39 to 40 or 41 to servers accordingly, and we have our frequency there as well. In the common page, we also have the ability to add an attenuator. Uh, our modulators, again, I'll touch on, uh, do launch quite high, certain ones, because they are commercial. They are designed for larger applications where you have losses incurred. So sometimes you need to attenuate it down to a level because you can't be too high. Um, things like LCN mode, uh, the, the software management side is a generally used product that's, because the product's worldwide, it is sold into other countries, other versions, um, and in some applications you have the ability to change certain settings. What we do generally is settings that are set required for Australia, we block out. We actually don't allow you to change them because some installers love to go and play and then they plug it in, it doesn't work, and the product's faulty. It's because they've gone and changed the setting. So what we do is we try to block out things that, don't, um, that will cause problems, that you don't need to change. What you're gonna do, though, is that every page that you've made a change, once you've finished with that page, you need to local save it. So you need to press local save to save these settings into the program, it hasn't dumped it onto the modulator yet, it's waiting till you're finished. But before you move to the next tab, you must locally save and it gives you like a little, I think it gives you a little tick next to it once you've done it. Uh, next tab over is the RF setup. Uh, this is where we change the TSID that we're talking about that's important, that we just go and put in our other number. Uh, that, that's really the only setting we need to change in this setup. Uh, depending on, again, the modulator, or either have Depending on how many RF outputs it has, it has a tab per output. So you would just go one, go to two, make my change, change my channel name or change my TSID and press local save and it's saved it on, ready for you to go to the next part. Encoder setup, uh, just going back over here. So this adjusts it per input. So we have a four input modulator. We have four different encoders. Uh, through here, we can change our program number that we stated to match our LCN. We can change our channel name. 
uh, we can change our LCN. So there's a few changes we can do on this page. Uh, these other settings, again, are normally defaulted, not changeable. Um, the only thing that you may look at changing in here also is if you wanted to run an MPEG-4 system because you wanted to run a 1080p product, which again, I'll touch on later. Uh, again, local save. Uh, network configuration. Uh, this setting here is more if you, um, you have your, your DHCP. Uh, as, a, as a standard, a lot of our modulators are DHCP enabled, so they just straight plug into a PC to get access to the modulator through the network. Uh, some of them you can disable and just go via an address. So this gives you the option to change that. And then admin is where we go into if we want to have a, a configured um, setup because we're using it on similar jobs. We can actually load in a file that makes all these changes if you wish. So you can save them for certain jobs and if you've got to go back to it or just got to add more to it, you can have a configuration. Also default it. Every now and then you've made some changes and you don't know what they are, sometimes you just wipe it back and start again. And also password, because there's a password in the, the, the GUI that you can adjust to suit if you want. Um, the original password is in the manual and it's simply just admin and admin123 to get access originally. Once you've done everything and you've done all your changes, then you do an upload and reboot. And that will dump all of your changes onto the modulator, reboot the modulator, because Hot changes, what we would call more hot, when you're, charge, when you're plugging and playing and changing things on the go, it, when you've done all your setup and changes on a modulator, it is best to reboot it, power it down, power it up, right, and get it starting from scratch again. So what it will do is when it dumps these changes, this will reboot itself, takes 30 seconds to a minute, and then bang, all the changes are on and it's ready to go. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Excellent. Um, what else did I want to touch on that? No, okay. Uh, a, a typical installation, um, either domestic or commercial, uh, you can add these into any application, as we said before. Uh, theoretically, you know, domestically in small applications, you've got MATV as a separate identity, you would mix that in accordingly. Uh, at the end of the day, the modulators are, are transmitting a channel like a tower, like a TV tower, just bit different. Um, so we just need to mix it in with the free to air, which we can do by using splitters in reverse, uh, amplifier if we need to. Very, very easy to mix with your free to air to get it to the end user so they just scroll up and down channels to access. We, we've kind of called modulation and this type of modulation a mum's and dad's product because they are the ones, and, and my mum, if you're watching, hi mum, uh, she's a classic of having a system where I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't see it anymore because it's HDMI 1, DTV, ATV. With this, you're mixing everything onto a TV bandwidth and it's just up and downs and it's just so easy for them to use. S uh, StarSurf from Clipsa was such a success because it was just so simple. It was so basic to end use, not everything else, but just the end user aspect. So this is the same. But it's also very easy to integrate into installations by using splitters in reverse and just combining. Uh, we also sell a 3x8 hub, which is a, um, a product that will combine signals from antennas and modulators, amplify it and distribute it to up to eight points in a simple little module so you don't have to worry about using passive and active other components. It's a residential solution product. It can only go to eight points. Uh, it's not really expandable. You get other problems if you do wish to expand, which we can, you can call tech support if you want. Uh, but this ability also, this, well, this system also gives you the ability to put targets on the end of your cables and control your Foxtel from your bedroom over your coax network. It's done by having uh, emitter ports on the back of the modulator that sit in front of the Foxtel box. Uh, a coax cable is run from the modulator to the hub. And then on the end of the cable in the bedroom, you have a target. And you aim your remote at that target. It sends the IR back down to the hub, out to the, Foxtel, uh, out to the modulator, and then via the emitter to the Foxtel box, and it will change your channel from your zone. So that's the other feature. You need to have this for it to work. Um, and what we just ask is read the instruction if you're doing it. Because there's a, one trick is that the only powering of the system using this configuration must come from the modulator. There's a power switch on the back of this that says power through or power on, and it sends 12 volts down to power our hub and sends 5 volts out to power our target. If that switch is not on, 
the IR and the product won't work. That switch has to be on and you do not put the power supply on the hub. You take the power supply off because it's getting powered via the modulator. Reason for that is back in the early days of this product, sometimes modulators, analog modulators and, and hubs were on different phases in houses and we had earthing issues and noise issues. So by doing it this way, we're running off one phase, we eliminated all those problems and it just makes it an easier solution to work with. Yes? So how robust is that product? Is it in the roof? Or it? it could be anywhere. Because it's, it's, cause it's remotely powered, uh, you can put it in the roof. There's no, it, it doesn't run hot. It's a 12 volt run product. Um, you, it's, it is designed to click into a structure cabling housing, but it doesn't have to be. You can have it anywhere. Some people have it behind the TV because you know, that's just the way it's been wired. Some people have it in the ceiling. Some have it in an enclosure. It's wherever you want to have it. Yes? If you're running a single point to single point system, yes. a digital module yes. through and you want infrared control, yep. you still need to use the RF. You do. Yeah. yeah, good point, Ben. Um, pretty Mike didn't bring that up. Yeah, it must be not very good. Uh, yeah, if some of the applications, like this, this is ideal if you're running it to three, four, five, six TVs, but as Ben says, what happens if it's just one and you want to control Foxtel from that one zone? Um, you must use this product. Even though it's only one point, it will not work without that. If you ran it straight from here to the target in the bedroom, your IR will not work. It must use a hub. Reasons for it, but I'm not going to talk about it, but you must use a hub. Sorry? Well, yeah, because you the targets are five volt. Um, so that, that's one. There's, there's many other reasons actually why it's to go through this. Uh, we, I mean, we sell, we sell far more of these that don't use IR and potentially don't even use modulators. It's, it's a good module for an installation in general that has everything in one housing. It, it is residential, as I said. It's not it's not single channel amplification and processing and so forth. It's, it's a quite simplistic product, but it's convenient and it works in a domestic environment very clear. Okay. Um, so that's understood. We're happy with that. Fantastic. What happens now is that because um, our modulators are designed either domestic or commercially to launch high for these things that we can incur down the line, what can happen is that through um, the setup and amplifiers and so forth, the signal still could be high. So a modulator will launch between 85 and 105 dB uh, with the ability to be attenuated down to in the 70s, low 70s. What can happen is that it's not attenuated, it's mixed in through amplifiers and you'll get to the TV point where you'll have a modulator level and a free-to-air level and they won't be the same there'll be a separation between them. Digital is a very robust system that can work off quite low levels. You know, as long as your signal is clean, you can run 50, 60 dB into a TV and it can work. What happens is, uh, and when we get the call where people will say, um, my TV system was fine, I've added in your modulator, and all of a sudden I get no TV now. All I get is your modulator, why? The reason for that is the modulator level is high, the free-to-air is low, all signals have noise levels. That noise level is now interfering with your free-to-air because it's X below the, the cap, right? Carry to noise, it might be 40, 45 dB. If it's at 100 dB, the noise is at 50. That 50 blocks the free-to-air. So what we need to do is balance the signal. So to rectify this, we need to get those levels close, within 10 dB, ideally around the 70s is where you want to have it. Uh, you can do this via attenuation, as it were either within the product or a passive link in attenuator, and then we can balance our signals down. To do this, we would hope that someone has a field strength meter to measure the signals. Now, unfortunately, not all do, and I understand that. That can be quite expensive, depending on what sort of one you're looking at. Uh, we do get people that, by adding an attenuator straight away, go bang, it's fixed, it thanks, goodbye. We don't hear from them again. But it's, it is a common problem that can happen, and it's purely balancing. Is that, is that clear? Has, has anyone ever been in that situation, or come across it? Or We, we, we do get it as calls. Um, and it's because free-to-air can come in, not, you don't need to use amplifiers, and I said, if it's clean, it will work. But then once we pop in 
pumping one of these babies, which is doing a little bit more, or a lot more, yeah, we just need to balance them out. Uh, the only other thing, um, just quickly, that I haven't included in the presentation, uh, in the past, uh, about three years ago, two years ago, we introduced the HD 1600 and now the 1600L. The difference with these two modulators is that they are MPEG-4 only. Now, as a standard in our country, we use MPEG-2, and all trans most transmission, all transmissions to recently from the, the TV towers was MPEG-2, and as long as your TV could do MPEG-2, you would get a picture. Um, we're only one of the, there's only a few countries in the world that do that. Most people do MPEG-4. Now, MPEG-4 has advantages over MPEG-2 with compression and what it can process and handle. And what we did is that the, the 1600 and 1600L are considerably cheaper than the other modulators. And the reason why is that they are MPEG-4 only. MPEG-2 encoding is expensive. And that's why we've got the high, well, that's why they're more expensive, and everyone's are, into the market. The, the 1600 and 1600Ls don't have that in it. That's why they're cost effective. But then when we first sold them, the issue that we had was that you would go to a job and you'd have six TVs or five TVs and maybe only one of them was new enough to have an MPEG-4 tuner in it that could process the signal. So one TV showed it and five TVs, four TVs would give you sound but no picture because they were MPEG-2 only. The, the way around that was one, to buy a commercial modulator that had MPEG-2 as an option, which they didn't want to go down because that's why they bought this one. Two was to buy a new TV, which they don't want to go buy three or four new TVs. The third option was to buy a set-top box that was MPEG-4, which is now quite economical, but that kind of sometimes defeats the purpose of going back to having the simple channel plan and the up and down scrolling. But that was the solution to move forward. What we've found in the last nine months is that that's turned around because of TVs being consumable and price points, people are buying new TVs, they're handing down their old ones, and now we're the other way around, where six TVs, only one of them's not working. Six of them will work fine. So MPEG-4 modulation, which is cheaper, will, will be something more acceptable as we move forward, um, which will be more cost effective. Um, as Mike and, and Danny will say, they've gone into a new venture which the pricing point should be more attractive as well, which will open up more doors and more applications. So these ones here that I've got on display and the majority of our models will do MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 and they are slightly more expensive for that feature. A couple of other things as well, where the 1600s, you're talking you know, uh, probably a third the cost of one of these per channel and that's the reason why it's, it's MPEG-4. If you get someone or if you're on a site and you go, I can use a modulator on this site, how do we check that the TVs are MPEG-4? There's now a very easy way to check it. it. Used to be you had to put one in, in a modulator in and try it and it either worked or didn't. Now you just get the consumer or you can do a TV rescan if it hasn't been done recently. And if you can view channel 78, which is the racing channel, and or channel 90, which is channel 9 HD, these are now transmitted from the tower as MPEG-4. And if they work, the modulator will work. So it's an easier way on a site to know that you can use this, or if you can't, you've got to go to a commercial one that does MPEG-2. Is that, is that clear? That makes sense? Okay. Uh, the other advantage of MPEG-4 is that it, it does have the ability to run higher spec, as in we can run 1080p down MPEG-4. So we can get HD, true HD through. On MPEG-2, the maximum resolution we can handle is 1080i. You might have come across an application where you've put an Apple TV module into an MPEG-2 modulator and you don't get a picture. It gives you pink screen or invalid format. And that's because MPEG-2 can't handle 1080p. We go to MPEG-4, we can handle 1080p. No problems. One of the other questions we're getting at the moment is what about 4K? Where, where, where's, where's it going with that? 4K has been used on TV manufacturers and advertised. The, uh, 4K is what you refer to as H.265 and in our factory we do have a H.265 module and we are playing around with 4K encoding onto H.265. That's the least of the problem. The problem is, okay, if we introduce it to market, what's your content? Foxtel's not 4K, it's not even 1080p. Um, Apple's not. You've got some, I think some YouTube and GoPros that can do 4K. So your content is your issue. I think there'll be some Netflix and other stream programs that might offer it soon. That's one problem. 
The other problem is well, what tuner is going to be able to play an MPEG H.265 signal? And I don't believe there's a TV, there's no TV on the market now, and I haven't heard any boo about a TV tuner H.265 4K. So eventually, maybe, but not at the moment, there's no 4K option when we come to modulation. It's purely 1080 or HD up to 1080i on MPEG-2 and 1080p on MPEG-4. Sorry? Yeah, it's still, uh, I'm pretty sure Ultra Blu-ray is still 1080p though, I think. I may be wrong, um, but the... It wasn't meant to be 4K. Was it meant to be or yeah. wasn't meant to be? Yeah, I, I think that I just don't, there's no content. The, the, the problem you have is that you, you can get the product, but what are you going to play onto it and how are you going to watch it at the other end? Uh, that, that's where we're at at the moment. The UK's UK, uh, and I think the US are trialling some other forms. And when we get to TVs, TVs through the HDMI have the ability, because HDMI can, can access a lot more. Um, it, it's a bit more flexible than what a tuner is. Tuners are probably one of the most cheapest parts in a TV these days. They don't, you know, like we, we've, you get a new TV come out and it's got a lower spec tuner in it and it causes other issues. Uh, we've, had to, we've actually changed our product to downspec it to suit certain TVs because the tuners are getting cheaper and cheaper. Right, we, we work, we get it to work. Um, it, it's just, <laughs> you, you, you're making, you, you're changing your product to suit uh, a product at the end of the day that's potentially not the standard. So, um, in due course that will evolve, but I, I don't believe we'll, you know, people will talk about it and you'll do it to your main TV and you'll run it via a, a means from your source to your main TV. But we're talking about distribution. We're talking about going to 32, 40, you know, 42, 46. I mean, pubs and clubs, you can go to bigger TVs and we can get 1080p and it's fine. Um, but we're not talking about a project, like a main TV in a main room. That's where, like in a home environment, you'll have that in your theatre room if you're going down that way. You're not going to have that in your bedroom. It's like 3D. When 3D was around and everyone was saying, I want 3D. Really? You want 3D on a 32-inch TV in a bedroom? <laughs> not really. I mean, it can, modulators can handle it, but no one's really going to use it. So uh, that'll be your next training session. We'll know more about where that's going and what that's doing. But it, it just, lately we have been asked, what about 4K? Okay, so what we can say is that we're aware of it, obviously. We have a, uh, an encoder that we're working on that can process it. It's just a lot of other stuff that's got to happen before it even gets to be a product. What about uh, Ethernet over coax? Ethernet over coax. We don't go down that track. Like we're, we're, we're modulating AV to RF and distributing, so it's not part of our scope or our, our model as such. You're not um, sort of stick on the, no, on the box. no, we're not. No, 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 we'll stay away from that. Okay, okay. in this range, we'll stay away from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, what we move to now is what else is available on the market? How else can we get signals around a a commercial, more, this is more commercial than domestic than for, for many reasons. So IPTV is your, is your next question um, and where are we going to play within that market? What we, we have now and we'll be developing more as we go forward is we have AV to IP encoders. So we have an IP1000 now which is a, uh, let me go to here, an IP1000 which is a, an AV import via composite component or HDMI that will encode that HD signal up to 1080p onto an IP address that's distributed out and accessed via its address. We've had this out for about a year. Um, good solid product where it's used when it's used. Um, I said distributing up to 1080p out and giving you true HD over IP. Uh, it has a few options where we can select its method of, of, of distribution. We can look at DLNA, which has certain applications, a bit limited. Um, it, it can't do 1080p and there's a few other things but it uses a bit less bandwidth. We can do multicast which is the most common form of distribution in IP or we can do unicast if you're going point to point site requirements. Uh, our encoders have the ability to pick, you can pick which method you want to distribute. What we're also going to be introducing is a four input version. So it's a 1RU house unit similar to size-wise to this and it will have four HDMI inputs that will actually, it works as four independent ones in one housing but it's in a one RU. So we're space saving, power saving on using the one power supply for the product. And then we're going to have an eight input version. 
which again is in a one RU, we can get eight HDMI ins and we'll get eight independent IP streams out of that unit. But again, it's in a one RU, it's not in, you know, if we use eight singles, we're taking up four, five, six RUs. These are in one RU units. There are applications at the moment, um, some campsites where they want to send out 32 um, AV channels over IP. It's just, just wired in Cat5, there's no RF, and this is their, their method in universities and campsites. So with this, you could do this with four of those with your spaces have taken up maybe six or seven RU to do all 32. Outside of that, you've got to go to singles and it's just complex, very complex. So these will be, in the next couple of months, released to market. Uh, in general, you're, you're talking about probably $1,000 per input. So it's not a cheap solution. Um, but as I said, it's a commercial product for commercial applications that via you know, the right system, it can be quite, quite user friendly at the end of the day. The other product we're moving into, um, just move on from that, is a DVB-T to IP gateway. So this product is aimed at, you have a situation where there is only UTP uh, and IP is its distribution method, but they want to get still free-to-air TV channels around over IP. So what this unit does, it has eight tuners built into it where we run antenna feeds into the eight tuners. For example, in Melbourne, we have five uh, services available. We have two, seven, nine, 10, 21, or whatever they call themselves, 31, they call themselves these days. What you would do is that this one will take um, ABC, seven, nine, 10, and 28, and you just, loop, you just loop wire them from point to point. And each of those tuners will grab channel two, for example, and go and put ABC on one IP address, ABC2 on another IP address, ABC, all the services on the independent IP addresses and then streams it out on one port. So you can put your antenna into here and get all of your free to air via this one unit out as an IP, independent IP addresses to put into your network and into your system. So these are being used again, um, recently uh, they've been quoted into universities where uh, they're, they've been wired out as an IPTV system. And this is the mechanism of getting free to wear out. With AV, they'll add AV in by using the other products. Um, you can also, if you, if you had a modulation system, you can inject the modulator into the other two tuners and it can give you that as an IP address as well. The, unit, the first unit we bring out will have the ability to have 32 streams. The second one will be 64 and the third one will be 128, all in a one RU unit. This is all good, um, but the problem comes with, okay, we need, we're going to put it in now. Because these can't, we sell one end of the product. We sell the streamers, we sell the encoders. That's the least of the problem when you're doing an IPTV system. It's a system, right? You need particular these, you need particular switches. How are you going to get it out of the TV? And what we come across and the calls that we get are more related to not necessarily the streamer, it's everything else to get it to work. You need to use a certain uh, layer two, layer three switches. You need to have IGMP snooping. You need to have certain things that only certain switches have. You can't just go buy generic switches and they will work in these applications. You need to use particular switches, right? It's a system uh, it, to, to the point that I don't know if there's a system, if someone's bought product, put it in, it's actually worked. They've had to go and I've got this problem, I've got that problem, and it's got to be configured to make it work. Marco, who's our tech support, you know, he will spend a fair amount of time on the day going through settings to get it to work that are actually not our product. It's the switches, wrong switches or settings within the switches. So what we're going to do um, is that we'll list on our website and list on Radio Parts' website the switches that we recommend. These are the switches. We'll list several. These, this is the model numbers to use if you're doing an, I, I, uh, an IP TV system. And these are the things you need to change to try and make it easier. Because I can tell you now, IP is not easy. For, for an IP guy or an IT guy, it can be. For us AV RF guys, it's nothing like RF. Our coaxis modulation is so simple compared to this. 
Uh, th this opens up a whole new can of worms, applications, and you know, it's a different ball game. And it, it's not here yet. IP is not, it's, it's spoken about. Sales don't support it. Applications don't actually truly support it yet. Still, you'll sell far more modulators than this stuff, but it will evolve around that IP will increase and it'll become more of a demand. So it's more of the adoption in areas that have. I'm talking about residential. Um, NBA has been doing it for a while. Yep. And it's the house. It's a lot of new houses. Yep. And you could sort of leave that and go all the way through the house. Yeah, you, these are, I said before, they're not really residential products for other reasons that, I, that I'll quickly tap on. Uh, if you're having it at your head end and you were wanting to show what that means, then yes, you've, you've got those facilities. The, ma the main reason why we state that it's not residential um, is the, the requirement that we have that we want to watch something live or if we're controlling it, we want to control it live. IP, all things that are encoders and decoders encode delays. Okay, um, a digital modulator, for example, will take 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a second to encode a source to a DVB-T frequency. And then it goes down the coax of the TV that then gets it and has to decode it to show it onto the TV. And it may take one second. So you've got between one and one and a half seconds before a signal is transmitted to a signal is received. And if you're in a domestic application where you want to control that channel, that can be a little bit of getting used to. They get used to it, but it's like, there's a delay, what's wrong? It's nothing wrong. It's like walking into Harvey Norman or Radio Parts and seeing a whole bunch of TVs on the wall showing the same channel on the tuner. And then when the picture changes, each one of them changes slightly differently. That's the tuner in its in decoding of the signal. Now, as I said in modulators, we're talking one second on the, the, the MPEG-4 versions and one and a half on the MPEG-2 versions. We go to IP and we start at three seconds and go through to 30 seconds. And that's just not going to be viable. If you're, leaving a static, if you're leaving it on a static channel, then that's okay. If you've got a gateway or something like that, or a, a university and they're leaving it on the static, then yes, you can look at that. But in a domestic home environment, it's, it's not viable. I, I don't believe at the moment it's viable. It's not cost effective and it's not viable at the moment. You, you can, what, where, where it can be an option is that you do have the ability to put it into a, a router, a wireless system, and send it over via certain applications to mobile devices so you can watch it on your phone and so forth. But they're, they're rare. You know, uh, not many people, I mean, I don't know, do a lot of people watch TV on their phones? Um, you, you got the application too, but yeah, it, but that, that, that's where we, that's why we say it's more commercial because it is more of a, a larger network, multiple distances because it's IP. It's a bit more robust when it comes to um, distances and so forth and what you're actually getting. Well, I'm sort of looking from a point of view of silicon dust product. Sorry, the silicon dust, you know, the network right, yep. uh, tuners. Yep. And using them, and they're coming out with fours and sixes yeah. and eights. Okay. Yeah, I, I declare now that IP is not my strong point. <laughs> um, so Mar Marco, Marco, it's more his strong point. Uh, yeah, and also, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. What, what we've just found is that there's a lot to learn when it comes to IP, which is not an issue, but just the knowledge out there is just not there. And a, and a lot of the guys who are who are trying to play in this system, you know, including myself, not the people I work with. The, their understanding is not where it needs to be and if you just try and you just think it's an IP address plug it into this and it should work and it doesn't it needs a lot more configuration and understanding and what we're just emphasizing is to look further into it make sure you do your research make sure you're aware um, you know don't uh, don't rock up into a job <laughs> and do it there set it up before make sure you understand and play around a little bit um, Ben's pretty good here with IP um, but understanding that as well. So I know he's done some training sessions more to do with CCTV, but it's similar sort of setup, but it, it's just to use the right components. Make sure you set them up correctly. That's what it is, so. Yep, no. <laughs> uh, the other thing too is obviously we, get, we send it out as an IP address. How do we access it on the TV um, or the, the PC? So there's a couple of options. Uh, you've got methods like VLC if you're using on PCs, they can decode it and show it. Um, we do have set-top boxes, uh, IP TV to 
uh, AV set-top boxes. And then now we also have TVs coming out that have set-top boxes built into them. Uh, so I think Philips have got a TV in particular that you can just run the IP straight into the back of it and when you turn the TV on it acts as a straight into the IP and works like a normal TV. So there's, there's other means of how you get it out at the other end as well now. Um, any more questions on IP? Is it, I, I, I'm not... Yes, we're advertising what we're selling, but we're more emphasising the importance of understanding IP before you move into it. There's a lot more to, to know about. It's not a, a plug and play solution like other products. It is a bit more detailed. And we just say, do, you, do your homework, do your, your testing. Just one question. Have you got a matrix? No. System? No, we, we, we've stayed away from HD based T yeah. and we've stayed away from matrix HDMI. We have had composite and component back in the day, but HDMI is a, um, an interesting creature and we've, we've stuck to what we do, RF, we've stayed out of, we leave it to Bluestream and other guys who are, who are adapt to that and do really good on that. Um, it, different, different product for different applications. Like you, 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 if you're doing an install, we're, we're commonly, we're getting a lot of um, sales at the moment, is your jobs where you're just running to multiple TVs because it's far more cost effective to use a modulator. You want to you send four channels, four inputs to 50 TVs on a, on a network it's a lot easier to do it over modulation. You're talking a couple of dollars for a, mod a couple of thousand dollars for a modulator, and you can get HD out to TVs and easy to use. You know, you don't need specific receivers at the other end or balance or worry about distances. It's a coax network. You can, as long as you manage your system, you can run it over, you know, 100, 200, 300 meters. It's not a problem. It's a, it's a frequency. Uh, the other thing we want to touch on. Uh, this is a product that we've sold for a long time. Uh, IR, we've, as Mike said, we've, we've won IR Year of the Award at IR Product of the Year at um, Connected Home for the last three years. Um, we're Fox, the only one that's Foxtel approved onto the market, if I touch onto this screen. Uh, that was done by Foxtel, who wanted a solution that would work with range, and ours was the one that they found to best support that. The main thing I want to talk about is one of the features in it that gets a bit confused through translation and people don't understand. And that is that we have the ability in our product to not just have multiple sources being controlled via IR, but we also have the ability to have two of the same source controlled separately through IR. Commonly, you're having two Foxtel boxes put into a house. They're being modulated or distributed via some other means. And you want to control one box from certain rooms and another box from other rooms without interfering because it uses a common IR command to do all its features, you turn, you go channel up on one, it goes channel up on both. So how, how, can, we, how can we do that in a cost effective format? You know, you, there are other ways to do it that are, are expensive-ish, this is a cost effective way of doing it. So you have a couple of key ingredients in the in installation. You have a, an IR uh, distribution module, if we want to call it. This is an IR305. This sits where your sources are. So it sits where your Foxtel boxes are or your Apple TVs are or whatever you're sending. And then it has emitter ports on the side that will go sit in front of the source you wish to control. You then have a, you can do it, you can wire it two different ways. You can wire it, either loop wire it to the target that goes into the room. This is the target module. You can either loop wire it that goes into this, then goes that to the next, that to the next, which is rare. Most people use a star wire. And when you star wire, you use a distribution module that we've designed, which is an RJ45 plug and play. So you run through your 305, cat 5 out to your distribution module, and then you can run up to seven zones out of the distribution module and put targets on each zone. Right? That's all straightforward, pretty simple. What you do then is you have the ability to... I thought that was my time, my time's up. Uh, you have the ability to then go, okay, I want this room to send IR to certain ports on this module. So when we've set up this module, um, we'll use an example of having two Foxtel boxes and we'll have a, a Blu-ray and an Apple module distributed. What we do is the Blu-ray and the Apple, which are using their own commands, we just wire into the common ports. So we just put an emitter from here to the Apple and here, here to the Blu-ray and so forth. But with our Foxtel boxes, what we'll do is we'll wire an IR from A to one box and an IR from B to the other box. In the zone, 
When the target plugs into this module, this sits behind the TV generally, we have a set of dip switches down here which allow you to dictate where this IR is going to in the hub, in the, in the distribution module. So for example, we have five rooms in a house, we have um, a main bedroom and a study, and they're going to control Foxtel Box 1, and then every other room is going to control Foxtel Box 2. So in the main room and the study, when we set this up, we, these are all in the off position. When you get them, you flick up. Okay, I want to control Foxtel Box 1 or A, you flick that up, leave B down, so you're not your IR is not coming out of here, and then flick your common up if you want to control your common. All right, in the study, you do the same thing. When you go to your other rooms, we do different. We leave A down, because we're not controlling A. We flick B up, so our IR is now coming out of B, and we can have common on or off. Via this, we can then go, we can set it up. It's not a full discrete system where if you switch to that, you control that because it's cost effective. This is set up that you control this box and you control that box. All done over Cat5 cabling, um, nice and neat entry level solution that can give you that flexibility. Does that make sense? Is that sort of clearing what it does? Um, uh, what's the other thing? So, so with, with the common, you can choose to just have A and common or B and common or just common or just A or just B. You wouldn't put them all on because at the end of the day you might as well just have everything common. So but you have the ability, if you've got two, you can break them down that way. The D, just quickly, or the direct, is certain brand amplifiers have an IR port in the back and our IR is quite strong, so this is attenuated because it normally floods the amp, so we've attenuated that port if you're using it into the back of the amp and the cable comes with it. It's rarely used, but it's in there. Uh, this distribution module too, just to give you a bit of a background, um, it's also a bit versatile, or very versatile, where you might not have your sources in the same area of the house. You might have some at one end of the house, or the business, and some at the other end. You can put one of these modules where one of your source, set of sources are, and put another one where the other sources are, wire them back over Cat5 into this module, and use two of the inputs, and then have it as a six output. And it will allow the IR to go to whichever of these is required. You could use three, you could use four, Parallel wide, you could do as you please. It can be one in seven out, two in six out, three in five out. Doesn't matter how you want to have it. Do you do that, Jason? Yep. If you've got multiple 305s, does yep. that one when you set uh, the 505 to A, yep. it goes to all the A's? Correct. Okay. Yeah, all the A's or all the B's or all the commons. So, yeah, so it, it's more, it, it, again, that's rare, but we have had applications where people have them in separate areas. They have one Fox box here and one Fox box there and they just want to be able to control them still through the system. So you have that ability. What you also have is on the back of that is IDC punch downs, and you can use them as well. So you could, in theory, have it one in seven out, and then you could, not too many, you could use maybe three of them on the back, and use IDC as well, and it will still do the system. Or you can just wire IDC. What, what we need to remember when we use this system and these products is this is pumping out 12 volts that's going out to here that then is running out to the zones to the targets. And we do get limitations to how far we run our cables and how many points we're actually wiring to. Now, one in seven out on 60 metres of cable is not a problem. That's, that's the spec. But we've tested it beyond that. We know it can do more. But we, just, we can't warrant it. We, you're better off trying it. We, we get calls of people that do some stuff they shouldn't do, and it works. So it's very flexible, um, but it's, it's very... Um, it, it can accommodate a lot of applications by that. The other product we have is the kit. I don't know if you guys have seen the IR kit, the IR100, the, the little pack. Um, it's our biggest seller that we sell of our whole range as in numbers wise. We, we sell nearly more of them than emitters themselves because they're just a simple solution. TV on the wall, equipment below or somewhere else and it's a kit that has everything you need in it. It's got a target cable of 2.7. You can extend that if you wish by using Cat5. You can run it up to 60 metres if you wanted to. Yeah, well, as I said, the spec is 60. Cat5, Cat6 spec is 60. It can go beyond that but we just don't emphasize it, that's up to what you want to do. So what you have is, here's, here's a scenario, right, where you'll have two sources that'll be discrete sources that we want to control separately, and then just some commons. You have a hub, 
that sits in the area or a distribution module within these devices with our emitters. We then wire Cat5 back to our distribution module and then we wire Cat5 out to our zones where we set our dip switches. And we switch them to A and or B and or C and get our control. The other benefit of this system is an installation feature of when you do your pre-wire to when you do your fit off if you've got that application. Everything's RJ45 connection on these. So your pre-wire is just to a point. Punch it down on the back of a point. When you come to fit off, just use a Cat5 lead to connect it, or Cat6 lead, to connect it to the wall plate. There's no other hard wiring in doing it. So it's very, very simple to pre-wire and to fit off if you've got that application. Very straightforward. Um, our targets are approximately 10 metres, are 12 volt powered targets. Uh, we've done a lot of work to get them where they are with Foxtel, which is normally a difficult product to control. Uh, we have it worked out through various proprietary means we're not talking about. Um, and we get a wide range, we get good blockage from uh, interferences, from TVs and so forth. A lot of our, tar our targets, if you've seen them, um, they're, they're not the prettiest target in the world, I'll admit. Um, and we've had samples to make them look better, but they don't work like these ones do. And at the end of the day, performance is the key in our product. We sell, our IR is not cheap, we're not the cheapest on the market but we sell the most because it works. You guys don't want to do boomerangs. You don't like going out to jobs and going back to jobs and so forth. So our product is solid and it works. And that, that's where we're, I'm not going to change anything because it works. I'll leave it the way it is because it it's, works. Um, any questions on that? Does that fairly clear? Self-explanatory? You guys are easy. Um, that's it. Uh, any questions on anything? That's not football. I had a funny situation the other day. Um, I wonder if you got a, a suggestion for it. We had a 1600 and we were using the HDMI loop out on it. Mm -hmm. But there's a bit of a delay on it. Uh, the loop out shouldn't have a delay. The modulator should have a delay. Um, no, the loop out... The, the, the only... That, that if we get any calls to do with the 1600, it's more generally to do with the AC3 because we that product to get it to market and knowing it's going to TVs, we haven't included AC3 in it where it is in the commercial ones. Um, and we get some people who are, who are wanting to pass it through to a TV but want the AC3 and that causes a sound issue. I don't believe there's a delay. There shouldn't be any. That's the loop through is not encoding. The the delay is encoding. Yeah, exactly. Was it a Pro Two lead? It was probably the lead. <laughs> <laughs> Check there. No, I, 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 it's that's actually most unusual. I, I, I'll look into that. I'll get um. I'll talk to you at the end. I got him to grab some other stuff to test around it. To see yeah. I've yeah. never heard that. Yeah, it's real. Uh, but the infrared control. Yep. The, the two tens and everything. Mm -hmm. There's no delay at all in the infrared, is it? The, is the infrared itself is live, yeah, right? It it's the signal coming back that shows you a delay. Yeah. You, you send an IR command down to change a channel, and if you stood in front of that Foxtel box, it happens instantaneously. There's no delay. The, the delay is, okay, that now goes to a modulator that encodes it, that goes to a tuner that decodes it, that gives you the delay. So, yeah, there's, there's no actual delay in that process. Um, yeah. The other, um, just going back to mods, uh, range-wise now, we've introduced an 8-input HD in a 1RU housing. Um, not, it, it looks like it's not for everybody. It, it is a lot in one unit, and a lot of guys on jobs sort of say that they want to be a bit flexible. You know, if one goes down, they don't want to lose all eight channels. They'd rather use two fours or eight ones or whatever they want to use. We, 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 our product is not immune, but it's fairly solid, and we're, we're confident in it. But for us, it's offering a range. You can buy whatever mixture you want. We've got the application for it. And some of our um, modulators, like the HD4002, has the ability and also simulcast IP output as well as DVB-T. So this modulator here will pump it out as coax, but it'll also put it out as an IP stream that'll go to an IP system if you wanted it. And it's not a multiplex format. Um, 
some product on the market will also do the IP output, but it's multiplexed into one address, and you need a reader like a VLC to break it down to four streams. This is actually pumping it out as four streams, four different addresses. So if you put it into a set-top box or a system, it would work, or a TV as such. It'll do so. Any other questions? If you've got any ones you don't want to say out loud, I'll be here for another five minutes to come up and ask. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you.